Uh, my name is Michael Burroughs, and uh, I'm Assistant Director of the Rock Ethics Institute and Senior Lecturer of Philosophy. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Judy Smetana uh, from the University of Rochester. And Judy, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm Judy Smetana. Uh, I'm, as Michael said, from the University of Rochester, Department of Clinical and Social Science and Sci Sciences in Psychology. Um, I'm a researcher who focuses on young children's social and moral reasoning and behavior. So I'm here to give the Waterbury Lecture. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. We're very happy to have you. Thanks. Um, to start, could you talk a bit about what sparked your interest in doing research and work in early childhood moral development? Um, my initial interest came from sort of a broader theoretical basis. Um, which was I was a graduate student um, and I actually began graduate school in social psychology and um, at the time I was in graduate school um, social psychology was going through a sort of period where people were saying we don't have any theory this isn't very you know it's all situational there's nothing very constant about human behavior I had the opportunity to take a graduate course in moral development where we read grand thinkers. So we read about Freud and Durkheim and Piaget and Kohlberg and I said, this is for me, this is so interesting. Um, so um, I began being interested in moral development and uh, I became interested in young children's moral development because in terms of the theoretical framework that I was working with, um, which was very new at the time. Um, no one had looked at young children. Um, claims were being made about children's social knowledge and um, the development of different types of social knowledge and trajectories of social knowledge. And it seemed to me that if one wanted to make that claim, one had to study young children, um, that you really had to look at the roots of morality um, to understand um, what was distinct about children's moral thinking. And mm -hmm. so that's how I began, mm -hmm. and um, it's kept me going for a long time. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit about um, social domain theory's relationship, um, maybe both in terms of points where it comes together with and departs from some other traditional theories of moral development? Um, it's most similar to other cognitive developmental approaches to moral development. So it departs from work by Larry Kohlberg, who argued that moral development um, develops through a sequence of six stages. Um, but what was important about his work was that he was looking at changes in the organization of thinking. Um, it's a critique of Kohlberg um, in that we do not agree with um, the sequence that he describes and, and believe that moral development is more complex, so it's not teleological in the sense of a specific endpoint, but rather how people coordinate different kinds of social knowledge. Um, but it's a cognitive constructivist approach mm -hmm. to moral development. Um, it differs from socialization approaches, social learning theory, um, that see morality as coming from outside um, being shaped, modeled, reinforced, and so on. Um, yeah, did you have other? <laughs> so I'm wondering what, what kind of, I mean, given that it's, it's not um, specifically teleological in nature, and it's not about socialization, so kind of like a, a Durkheim kind of conception of you know, moral right. development or something like that, um, how does it develop, how, how does morality develop from within? Like what are the kinds of interactions that are leading to that or maturity? How, how is that conceptualized in your work? So um, we think of morality as developing out of social interaction. So I wouldn't say it's just within. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's in interaction with the environment. Um, so children have different kinds of social experiences um, with uh, in different kinds of relationships with parents and with peers. Um, and their, for instance, their experiences of harm, injury, welfare, um, justice, rights, lead them, so for instance being hit or hitting others, um, lead them to focus on the victim's reaction, um, how others are feeling, and so on, and 
over time, they begin to construct notions of, of morality, of fairness, welfare, and rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what, is, what part do you think that education plays in constructing those ideas of fairness and rights? And, and part of the reason I ask, I, I mean, if, if any, um, it's part of the reason I ask is that it seems like if you didn't already have some construct in place, say about fairness or rights, then you could just continually re be repeating, say, an unfair action and never really be able to have a, a frame of reference to recognize, oh, this is something I need to think about in terms of, of fairness. It seems like there needs to be some concept in place already in order to start grouping like acts of fairness or unfairness mm -hmm. together, if you know what I mean. I'm wondering how it's maybe a chicken and an egg problem a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I think it, it is a bit. I mean, children have these experiences very early. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they young children have so many experiences of harm and fairness, just little everyday instances, and they begin to make inferences, infer from them. People call their attention to them. There's a victim responding, and um, so you're saying, why do they? I'm, won I'm wondering how they start to, how, how young children start to recognize something as, say, in terms of fairness or, or unfairness, if it's not something that's coming from, say, a teacher or a parent yeah, saying, because, hey, that's unfair. Because actions have intrinsic consequences. Mm -hmm. So you hit someone, it hurts. Um, you're hit, and you see that it hurts. They cry, they react. You might have parental reactions saying, that's wrong, don't hit, you know. Think about how you'd feel in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. So we're surrounded with these experiences where we're seeing what happens in response to violation, to moral violations, mm -hmm. and children begin to make inferences both from the reaction of the victim, the cognitive messages, you know, sort of their own experiences of I didn't like it, he hit me, and you know it was wrong, and so they begin to form more systematic notions mm -hmm. of right and wrong. Okay. And so within social domain theory, I know you're, you're positing at least three distinct domains of, of social knowledge right, that children have and develop. Yes. Um, the moral, the social, and the psychological or personal. Yeah, the societal, actually. OK, societal. I think that's clear. Societal. Um, how do you, in your work with children, how exactly are you, um, especially with young children, you know, say like three or four-year-olds, what are some of the ways in which you're able to kind of parse out and understand and see that there actually are these different domains? Um, and related to that, do you find cases where one domain develops at a much faster rate than another? So those are really good questions. Mm -hmm. um, our, my methods for looking at children's social knowledge and um, distinctions in particular between morality and social convention are that I've developed an interview where we present children with prototypical examples of moral and conventional, sort of clear-cut examples of moral and conventional transgressions. So um, moral transgressions can pertain to harm to others, things like hitting or kicking or hurting another person. Um, conventional, we try to find um, familiar conventions, so that could be eating with a fork, and, you know, eating ice cream with a fork, or observing preschool conventions about where you put your, your backpack, or where you sit, or you know, when you're allowed to line up. Um, so we give prototypical examples, um, usually des descriptions along with um, pictures, and we ask a series of judgment questions. And the questions are derived from the criteria that we believe define each domain. So um, part of the definition of morality is that actions are, transgressions are generalizably wrong. Um, they're not wrong just in one context. It's, it's wrong to hit at home, it's wrong to hit at school, it's wrong to hit on the bus. Um, whereas social conventions usually pertain to a particular context. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have one rule at home about whether you wear, you know, you, you can wear your shoes inside, but there might be other rules in other places. So we ask um, whether actions are wrong in different contexts versus particular to a context. We ask about um, whether the wrongness is 
based on the rule or whether the rule is based on the wrongness. Mm -hmm. And um, we found ways of asking children. That's a pretty difficult. It's like the Euthyphro problem from uh, Plato. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's complex, but mm -hmm. we found ways of asking young children those questions. So would it be wrong if, if there wasn't a rule in your school? So would it be wrong to hit, even if there was no rule? Would it be wrong to leave your backpack on the floor if there wasn't a rule about it in your, in your school? Or would it be wrong if your teacher didn't see, uh, didn't, didn't see it, didn't tell you that it's wrong? Those are pretty sophisticated notions, but kids get that. Mm -hmm. um, so we use criteria like that to see whether they're making distinctions between different types of social acts. We also ask them to rate how serious different kinds of transgressions are, um, how deserving they are of punishment. Now, um, those are not, those are our ratings that I think are correlated with domain distinctions, but they don't define domains. So moral transgressions tend to be more serious um, than conventional transgressions, but they don't have to be to make it moral. So um, there was a really clever study um, about asking kids about, um, I think it was stealing an eraser versus, I can't remember what the, oh, maybe it was wearing pajamas to preschool, mm -hmm. something that was a much larger conventional transgression than the moral transgression. And kids still treated the moral transgression even though it was minor and they rated it as less serious, but they applied the same criteria that it, would, uh, that it was generalizably wrong, mm. that it was wrong whether or not there was a rule, whether the authority forbade it and so on. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we look at ratings because they're informative, mm -hmm. like of seriousness and deserved punishment, but they're not criteria that define the domain. Okay. And do you see instances, if, as you look at kind of a developmental trajectory, where the moral domain or the societal domain is um, much more developed than another? Yeah. Um, <coughs> so part of what we hypothesize is, I mean, the early work focused on distinctions between domains, which is what I've just described. Mm -hmm. um, another part of the theory is that children's concepts develop, and that's what you're pertaining, what you're asking about in this question. Um, there's been a little bit of work describing the developmental sequence of children's conventional concepts. Um, that was work that was done quite a long time ago by Elliot Turiel. Um, that work hasn't really been replicated or widely disseminated. Um, we have some ideas about what develops within the moral domain, but we don't have benchmarks a la Kohlbergian stages. Mm -hmm. So it's a little hard to address the question. Mm -hmm. Really where the research has gone is more along um, the notion of identifying distinctions in that people have looked at how children reason about more complex examples instead of um, prototypical events, looking at events that potentially involve overlapping concerns from different domains. So a lot of social actions are complex and aren't straight moral, straight conventional. And so part of what we've used domain theory to do is to identify, um, to look at how children identify different com components, whether they coordinate them in their reasoning and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm wondering, um, you know, I think one of the aspects of your work and Turiel's work um, that's been very important for people like me and some of my colleagues has been, you know, kind of rethinking children as moral agents, right, as opposed to pre-moral beings. Um, and I think that resonates with many of us who work with children um, as, as true, as very true in what we've encountered. Um, and an important aspect of you know, treating children with the proper respect, really, to, as, as beings that do have moral concerns, as opposed to beings who are just indoctrinated into having moral right. concerns. But I, I'm wondering um, what that might mean for considerations of moral responsibility. Like, if we think of children as moral agents, um, or as having moral concerns, as being, aware, as being capable of making moral judgments, then what does that mean in terms of our descriptions of moral responsibility of children about well, their actions? I think we have to be careful when we <laughs> say that children make moral judgments. <laughs> they have a rudimentary moral sense. Uh -huh. It's not fully developed. Uh -huh. So do we want to um, ascribe moral responsibility as mm -hmm. we would to adults to a child? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, we know that, I mean, 
we know that they have some rudimentary sense of why moral actions are wrong mm -hmm. as distinct from conventions or other types of acts. Prudential acts, for instance, are pragmatic. It doesn't <coughs> mean that they're able to flexibly apply moral concepts in diverse mm -hmm. situations and in abstract situations. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of development. Sure that has to occur. Sure, so, so it's, it's not one and the same. In terms it's of, right, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah. they're making moral judgments, yeah. but moral, moral judgments develop and mm -hmm. become more complex, more generalizable, more abstract, and mm -hmm. so on. So we're at the beginning of a developmental process. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've learned is children are much more morally sophisticated than we gave them credit for, mm -hmm. or that um, certain theoretical frameworks mm -hmm. gave them credit for. But it doesn't mean mm -hmm. But, but we are at the beginning of a mm -hmm. developmental process. So given that, and that we wouldn't want to just wholesale say, you know, uh, obviously children are not the same as adults, um, n depending on how we make the child-adult distinction, which is, can be fluid right. and flexible, but nonetheless, we could say at the extremes of the continuum, there obviously is important developmental differences between children and adults. But that being granted, um, do you think there are practical implications for how we think about responsibility in children, given your work? Hmm. Well, I guess I'd have to ask you what you mean exactly <laughs> <laughs> by moral responsibility. Well, let me, here, here, I guess here's what I mean. I mean, what I find is that there are, we're much more willing as a society to offer moral praise to children about actions. Um, so that is a brave child, what a brave action that that mm -hmm. child made, um, that the child performed. Um, and that could be something small, like um, uh, standing up for uh, a friend, or it could be something that we find to be, you know, desegregating a school, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Um, and many of us, and including researchers, people who work with children, want to offer more, extend moral praise. But I find that we're much less likely to extend moral blame and say, uh. and say, that, a child, and say that a child is blameworthy morally for being discriminatory or pushing someone down. And we would say, oh, well, it's a child. You know, she is still developing. Uh, and it seems to me that agency goes both ways, right? And so I'm wondering, that, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it, is, is it emerges okay. a bit of a problem. So, I mean, I would say, wouldn't want to say it's a bad kid, mm -hmm. but it might be that the action isn't good, mm -hmm. the act is bad. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a, a old rubric in parenting, liter the parenting literature, so, you know, talk about the act, not the child, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that applies here, that uh, it's, it's wrong to hit. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the, the child is, so if you want to apply, is the child blame worthy? Well, they should, it, was, it wasn't a good decision to hit, it was wrong to hit. It right. doesn't mean that the child, I mean, it's sort of character versus mm -hmm. the yeah. act. Yeah, yeah, and that could be a point that we might make to be a, a broader point even about adult actions and I absolutely, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. we know that people are inconsistent. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, I, there are some ways in which character notions are very powerful, but in general, I think it's, we know that so much behavior is situational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it's not the most productive way to think about morality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we can definitely, I mean, I think we're quite willing to say that it was wrong to hit we might want to know more about why they thought it was acceptable or if they thought it was acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, you know, sometimes we can, there, there are issues of self-control for young children mm -hmm. as well as moral judgments. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we should have a problem saying it's wrong to do that, you're hurting somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, um, if you see or, or how much of a connection there is between social domain theory and people who work in social domain theory such as yourself, your conception of ethics and morality and some philosophical theories of ethics and morality. Like what areas of, of, of philosophical ethics and morality um, are influential for your and others' work in your, in your area? Well, it clearly it, it draws on deontological theories, philo philosophical theories, so. Um, Gorth, Rawls, and I, I mean, I know that there's contention about their, uh, in terms of their standing in the philosophical literature, mm -hmm. um, but I think some of their work really does inform um, our basic notions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Martha Nussbaum. Martha Nussbaum. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think her work is great. Yeah, yeah, I do too, actually, yeah. Um, 
that's pretty much what I had in mind. I mean, I'm, are there other, other aspects of your work that we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about? Hmm. Well, just to say that um, I think we've made a lot of progress in understanding some of young children's capabilities, mm -hmm. but I think we have we still have a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm excited to continue with this work mm -hmm. and bring in, I've been bringing in things like theory of mind, empathy, um, and hoping to move away from studying prototypical transgressions with young children to more complex situations, mm -hmm. and I think it will help us better understand both young children's competencies, but also the limitations in their thinking, mm -hmm. um, which I think would be very fruitful. Mm -hmm. well, thanks very much, and thanks for talking with thanks. me today. <laughs>